from the Kingdom of Gondor, over the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, or even the city-states along the sword coast of Faerun in the Forgotten Realms. Feudalism is usually the most prominent form of government in fantasy settings, as most are modeled after medieval and early modern Europe. The issue is that most people have a hard time to grasp what feudalism was, while most settings don't help. By making feudalist kingdoms into something closer akin to a modern state. Yet feudalism is vastly different. Which is why I'll make this into my first video about world building countries. A state is a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. This quote by the German sociologist Max Weber is one of the most famous ways to quickly describe what a state is in one sentence. A state is a centralized organization and a set of political organizations which separates the ruling power within a community and society. The key is that feudalist kingdoms weren't states. Under feudalism, no lords, including the king, claimed the monopoly over state violence and thus over the control of the entire community and society. Vassals served the lords and kings, but unlike a state administrator or your local mayor, vassals remained free to exercise power in their fiefdoms as they so generally fit. And then there were other factions like the church for example. It's easier to see feudalism as a set of contracts, agreements, traditions, no matter if faint or real, and obligations. Feudalism was a constant struggle for power between the king and the nobility and the church and the cities but let's ignore those players for now so it stays simple. The king was usually the person with the biggest army while everyone else had a smaller army. Wassels had to send parts of their army to the king. How many and in which situations differed from lord to lord and from country to country depending on the contracts and obligations they formed with the king to become their vassals in the first place. Each vassal had their own contracts with crown and king and all of these contracts got renegotiated at least whenever one of the party got replaced. Yet both parties were always on the path of war. Rebellions were commonplace, especially once vassals didn't gain any privileges by diplomacy anymore or thought the king was weak. They exploited said weakness to their own benefit, ranging from simple policy changes, more autonomy or even ways to replace the king. But this was was basically a necessity for the vassals, as kings would otherwise just centralize more and more power on themselves. My favorite example for this is Emperor Barbarossa, who oftentimes fought in the south of the empire, which is today's Italy, to keep the fledgling Italian city-states in line and to reduce their autonomy. He failed, but partially because every time he went south and fought the Italians, the German nobility rebelled and demanded privileges and at one point even the imperial crown. Besides being a balance of warring warlords struggling for power, feudalism was an economic system. And since the medieval economy was mostly revolved around the land, it was also a system of land control. Serfs had obligations to the lords who had their obligations to the king. The king on the other hand gained the nobility's loyalty through handing out land or other privileges. But land wasn't loaned out the same way a landlord rents an apartment to a tenant nowadays. You can think of it as a set of privileges and rights kings and lords handed out to their vassals. And they did oftentimes overlap and become very fussy. Our favorite medieval abomination, the Holy Roman Empire, became a cluttered mess for multiple reasons. But first and foremost because of the way the rights and privileges were handed out. Instead of clearly set borders the vassals ruled over, it was a fuzzy, sprinkly mess. Certain zones of rulership that overlapped at times with other zones, for example, the the Abbey of St. Gaul in Switzerland has been an important religious center in the Holy Roman Empire and has been one of the most powerful clerical lords which held power as much as the nobility did. Despite being in today's Switzerland, St. Gaul held rights and land all over Germany and Italy and all those rights were on different levels. On the other hand, the most underrated medieval abomination, the Duchy of Burgundy and its dukes are the best example on how 
those rights even transcended kingdom borders, as the dukes were vassals of both France and Germany. All these holdings and the obligations were written down in massive books called Urbarium, the most famous of which is the Doomsday Book, the Normans wrote after they conquered the Kingdom of England. Those Urbarii are basically those Excel tables one guy at your company wrote 20 years ago, but he died, so nobody knows how it still works, but it keeps the entire company running and once it breaks, everything falls apart. Especially since those Urbarii are mostly about taxes and earnings. A lord could have the right to mint coins in a certain area he lords over, but not the others. Collecting taxes, the right to take court and act as a judge, and most other rights were handed out and were stacked on top of each other on different degrees. In the Holy Roman Empire, the lords began cultivating and establishing their own realms really just from the 14th century onwards, but especially beginning with the 16th century. But even at the time their own personal lands overtook the lands they got as a fee. The lords were still vassals and had obligations to the king or the emperor. Since this video isn't really about feudal societies and more about feudal kingdoms on a governmental level, I won't talk much about this. Just know that serfs had obligations to their lords the same way the lords had to the king, while the lords gave out privileges and rights in a similar way to the serfs. And that not all peasants were serfs. Many were free and cities were generally inhabited by freemen. I'll do a video about feudal society on its own one day, so stay tuned and subscribe. Like always with world building, making a believable feudalist kingdom can be broken down to the vibes. The way you present it makes it possible to add or hide certain details and stuff you didn't think about. In the end, nobody needs the Ubarii Excel table filled out. So I got four questions to ask yourself when you create a feudal kingdom, from which you can get into further detail by just answering the questions that evolve out of those. So who is the leash of your feudal them and who are the vassals, in which relations they stand to each other, what is the general power dynamic between vassals and leech, and is there a balance or a disbalance in the realm. This can go into any direction, which vastly changes the dynamic within the realm and what it might turn into. See Germany and France. You don't have to make a contract for each of your lords of your realm, but think about what the customary obligations and privileges in your realm are, and of course how much each party honors those. Just as important for feudal realms are the ways of succession, how each lord gets replaced by the next. To put it lightly, succession laws were a mess in Europe and are basically the reason the countries in Europe are shaped the way they are today. This question is obviously one of the biggest points of tension and is an easy way to put some conflict into your setting. But during successions, it's not just your sons that were put on the throne. Another common way of succession was splitting your realm and giving fair parts to your sons. There were kingly elections like in the Holy Roman Empire or many other ways of succession. So be creative as you like. It's one of the best ways to set your realm apart from the many many direct successions seen in fantasy. And if you are at it, at interesting rights of successions that a new aspiring lord must go through. Think about the government on a bureaucratic level and how it works, in what way the lords and the king keep their power and their wealth in check. Basically a broad idea on what those Obarii excel tables could look like and work, plus some other things like the way they execute their executive powers. You'd get mad if you write this out in total detail about every nook and cranny of your world, yet the logistics and the way governing in your realm works is something your characters in a book or your players in a campaign will have contact with at one point or another, so make those clear. And now that you have a way how your kingdom keeps its power and wealth, think about how they project and show those powers. Of course, armies and castles are the first thing that hop into mind, but those are very expensive. In medieval Europe, many kings and lords gifted the church money, they built monasteries and churches, they built to remember. And there are two cliche things I still very much love, noble galas and parties, and of course tournaments. Both are ways to project your power, especially if you keep those in or around your newly built castle or city or whatever else you just built. 
So let's create a feudal kingdom ourselves then. The setting I usually use for those videos overcame feudalism on a governmental level, but we'll just start in the past. This way we can use the feudal foundations we built in this video whenever we get to the state video. The United Kingdom of Norik Mars Losnik, our fair village of Unterkrombach is part of, was formed out of the personal union of the kingdom of Norikmar and Slosnik. Who could have guessed? In the past, however, the kingdom of Norikmar has been the Grand Duchy of Norikmar. It was a splinter of the former High Kingdom of Tregos, which formed during the war against the giants. But that High Kingdom collapsed into several kingdoms, duchies and principalities after a series of succession disputes. The Grand Duchy kept the old legal traditions of the kingdom, but tweaked it to their needs, first of all. The Grand Duke of Norikmar is the duchy's liege. Like most monarchs during that time, he was a primus inter pares, the first among equals. The Counts of Norikmar held a lot of power and were allowed to stand so the Grand Duke's actions, as much as he could censor theirs, of course. The vassals had no obligations to help the Duke during wars of aggression, which they usually exploited to gain further benefits during these times. That's the main reason why the Grand Duke looked beyond the borders in terms of marriage. The Grand Duke's personal holdings were relatively slim, as they held the big city of Verona, which acts as the capital to this day, and two small baronies in the mountains around the Groms Lake but their international diplomacy allowed them to gain help from beyond the borders through foreign mercenaries and sometimes even nightly retinues should rebellions go out of hand. While the other realms kept the oath stones of the former High Kingdom, the Grand Duchy didn't have access to any, which is why the Grand Dukes marry into their vassals just as much as they marry into foreign houses. Because of the marriage culture, an intricate form of courtly love developed as well which I will get into further detail later. A quirk of the relative powerlessness of the Archduke is that unlike in other places, the defense against magical creatures like dragons befell to the respective counts instead of the Grand Duke. While the succession of the Grand Dukes and Kings of Norikmar are decided by direct succession nowadays, the feudal kingdom succession was a bit more esoteric. After the death of the former Grand Duke, the youngest member of the Grand Duke's blood Line, had to participate in a set of trials that were put in place by the druid circles, the arc wizards, and the lords of the realm. While they were overseen by several spirits, fairies, and gods, the bloodline had pacts with. While those tests were hard and arduous in the past, the tests became easier and easier over time until they were nothing more than a spectacle. While the successor was decided upon by the former Grand Duke and their advisors. Originally, these were necessary to decide upon a worthy successor while getting rid of the old succession laws that split the High Kingdom into factions. Nowadays, these traditions are kept as a way to showcase the new heir to the realm. Most of the Grand Duke's income came from marriage contracts instead of the taxes they earned through their vassals. While their own holdings barely kept them afloat, the city of Verona might have been the biggest city east of the Elvid Mountains, sitting along the river Krom, but the city basically governed itself as they gained many privileges and attract artisans, spellcasters, and traders from foreign lands. Tariffs are the only way for the crown to exploit the city's economy, and they aren't even high enough to cover many of their expenses, which means the Grand Dukes were in a constant state of debt until they married into another noble house, earning money through presents and gifts. The uh, serfs might have had their obligations, but they became freemen after 30 years of work after gaining their lands, while being allowed to keep it for themselves, which again turned most of the population into freemen early, and the freemen's taxes weren't that high either. And despite their low personal income, the Grand Dukes were masters of building grand palaces, only surpassed by the kings of Bourbon. Their grand palaces were the way to make them into attractive partners, as they feigned money and prestige, which later turned into actual money as they faked themselves into marriages, which in turn gave them enough money to finance those many projects in the first place. The marriages themselves became big spectacles over years at times. Letters of love 
between the two arranged for marriage were published in newspapers or were read aloud on market squares. And it doesn't even matter for whom, as long as they carried the name of the ruling house, the marriages turned into realm-wide holidays and feasts and they barely had to spend any money for those as it became an honor and a matter of prestige to donate money for those marriages, grand feasts and holidays as the biggest donators were praised by the marrying couple and the grand dukes themselves. The uh, grand ducal army on the other hand was relatively low. They never kept any big retinues, relying on levies and gifted mercenaries. Merrily the tribes and clans of the Elvet Mountains, including the Kromsvolk, were their aces in the holes. Uh, those clans saw themselves obligated to the archducal house and acted as their sword and shield until foreign aid should arrive. So that's it for today's video, world builders. Tell me about your feudal kingdoms in the comments. And if you got so far, think about liking and subscribing. You seem to enjoy my videos. See ya!